Women's history is a link of inspiration from one groundbreaker to another. And Yahoo is here to celebrate it all from inspo to impact. After all, women continue to achieve in every arena, from politics to science, and from the culinary world to the radio waves. Over the next hour, we'll speak to women who have made an impact in their industry, and we'll show how iconic figures in history pave the way for their success today. Because everyone is inspired by someone before they grab the reins and chase success on their own. Our next guest did just that. Dr. Ruth Westheimer, best known as simply Dr. Ruth, is a cultural icon who has thrilled audiences for decades and completely changed the way we talk about sex. You've had such a long and successful career. I wanna go back to the beginning though. I heard that when you were a child, you found a book about family planning. How did that spark your curiosity about sexuality? No, the book was about sex. Yeah. And uh, maybe it mentioned something. I doubt it that in those days it mentioned something about family planning, but it certainly showed pictures mm. of a couple making love. So uh, I'm in a, with a smile, say this was maybe my first introduction to sexuality. Because in the, I say, when I look at the pictures, that's what my parents are doing with no clothes on. They are wrestling. And then I'm saying, so uh, that's why they close the door. <laughs> so we can all learn something from that. I still say to uh, anybody who makes love to close the door. So you think that moment sparked your, who we know as Dr. No, Ruth, no? No, I was an only child and I was a good student at the school uh, until I left at the age of 10 and a half because of the Nazis. Mm -hmm. And um, if I had not been sent to Switzerland, I would not be alive mm -hmm. because so many of the other Jewish children from Germany did not make it. Mm -hmm. Switzerland took 300 children. Mm -hmm. I was one of them. Holland, Belgium and France each took 300. Mm. England, despite the fact that before the war there were already dark clouds on the horizon, mm -hmm. England took 10,000 Jewish children. So uh, I was an only child. I did not want to leave Frankfurt, mm -hmm. but I had no choice. My father had been taken to a labor camp. There was no, there were no concentration camps yet. Mm -hmm. And uh, the postcard came that I have to join the group to Switzerland so that he can come back from the labor camp to Frankfurt. So I had no choice, I joined, and that's why I am survived, and that's why I have an obligation to help to make the world a better place. I didn't know that that would be through good sex, but that's what happened in my life. Let's go back to your first boyfriend, and, and when you were dating, did, did anybody teach you about sex or did you have to learn through no. exploration? I, I certainly had to learn not just about sex. That doesn't sound right. I had to learn to be touched mm. because from the age of 10 and a half when I left Frankfurt, left my mother, my grandmother, my other grandparents, aunts and uncles, my father had been taken to a labor camp, as I told you. Mm -hmm. I had not been touched until uh, um, Walter and I became boyfriend and girlfriend. That was very important. I didn't have to be taught mm. how to kiss and how to be touched. And then when we fought, it didn't matter. He was still my first boyfriend. He still was the one that sang to me, you are my sunshine, my only sunshine. And. Um, I'm very grateful, and that's why I'm still talking to him like once a week to Israel <laughs> wow. and why I visit him every time. And when he comes here, he, he also visits. So I don't have a high school diploma. However, listen carefully. As of yesterday, not only am I on the board of the Washington Heights and Inwood Y for 52 years, not only am I a very active member of the Museum of Jewish Heritage, a living memorial to the Holocaust. Mm -hmm. As of yesterday, I'm also on the board, a governor of Ben Gurion University in the Negev in Israel, 
and look at this, and I tell you why it makes me jump for joy. <laughs> when I heard that I'm going to be on the board, I raised money, $130,000, for the university for scholarships. And what makes me very happy, there are Bedouin women in the south of Israel that were not permitted to go to high school, like me. Now they can go to high school and now they can even get a scholarship, a Dr. Ruth K. Westheimer scholarship at the University of Ben Gurion in the south of Israel, where I'm now, as of yesterday, a, a governor. Uh, Not bad in my life. Very cool. Right. Very cool how you continue to inspire and use your platform to help people. That's so inspiring to me. So it sounds like education is something that's so important to you. And you have gotten a lot of education. You studied psychology. You got your doctorate from Columbia. You studied as a sex therapist for years. Mm -hmm. Why was an education so important for you? Because my father, whom I had not seen from the age of 10 and a half, I knew how much he valued education. Mm. And he did say, education, nobody can take away from you. So no question that I took that to heart. Mm. And uh, education for me is very, very important. So for everybody, even if they did not have a high school diploma, check it out, get some courses, fill in what is missing, and go to community colleges or go to the university, get your education. And, and I think you're an example too, is there's no age limit on that, right? And there's no age limit. Stay tuned because we'll have more with Dr. Ruth on Yahoo's Women's History Month, Inspo to Impact. In the world of sex therapy, was there a doctor who really inspired you? Yes, certainly. Who? There was Dr. Helen Singer Kaplan. Yeah. She was the first to write a book about sex therapy. It's called The New Sex Therapy. It's like, it's almost like the Bible for sex therapists. Mm -hmm. She was at Cornell University. She did, she did not want women like me or men in her program who were not physicians. But I did ask such a good question when she gave a lecture that she accepted me. Do you remember that question? And I don't remember. The, okay. Yes, I do remember. It was something about premature ejaculation. Ah. Yes, I do remember. And how fortunate she was really my mentor. I worked with her for five years, two years, twice a week being trained. 
three more years, I stayed on the program for no money to help train other sex therapists. Wow. And it's very interesting, she's not alive anymore, that I still refer to her book and tell anybody who is interested in sex education or in being a sex therapist mm -hmm. to make sure to read Dr. Helen Singer Kaplan, The New Sex Therapy, mm. in addition to my other books. Yes. What made her such a force? What made her so innovative? What made her innovative? That she was courageous. Mm. We were in the cellar of Cornell University, was the program. Then later we moved <laughs> up to the second floor. And she was courageous as a psychiatrist to be able to say we need to have sex therapists. Mm, yes, and for a woman during that time, do you think that that was extra difficult? That, 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 there was very, there were really no other sex therapists mm. with her credentials mm. as a psychiatrist and being a woman. Mm -hmm. So it's no question that my, uh, my success was not only that I was well-trained, not only that I had this wonderful Dr. Helen Singer Kaplan as a mentor, but also that I had, I had the courage to talk about orgasm and, and clitoris mm -hmm. and all the things that I talk about on the air and people listen to me mm -hmm. because I still find people who say they listen to my radio program, which became mm -hmm. number one in New York, mm -hmm. and uh, I talked very openly, and the reason they all remembered me is my accent. <laughs> and that I could use humor, not jokes, no stupid jokes, but humor to talk about that important subject. Yeah, I mean, you built this amazing career, and I, I learned that some of that, those ideas started when you were working at Planned Parenthood. How did Planned Parenthood inspire you to do more of this work? Right. So, first of all, I needed a job. <laughs> and I got a position in research as, at Planned Parenthood of New York City. And then the uh, fellow who hired me, Stuart Cattell, retired. Hallelujah for me. I got his job. And what inspired me is my work in Harlem. Mm -hmm. I followed 2,000 women and their contraceptive history and learned of how they, uh, very many of them did not have access to contraception. Mm -hmm. Many of them didn't know about contraception. And I trained paraprofessionals to be family planning counselors. I used that data of 2,000 women, Puerto Rican and black women in Harlem, mm -hmm. uh, to, uh, for my doctoral dissertation. So I was very fortunate that I had help in terms of the research um, and in terms of writing it up then as my doctoral dissertation. And then I realized I needed to know more. That's when I went to Dr. Helen Singer Kaplan. That's when I added, in addition to being a sex educator, mm -hmm. to be a sex therapist. Mm. That is so cool. <laughs> and this was during uh, the women's liberation movement, right? I it, mean, it was a really high time of activism. Yes. So how did that inspire the kind of conversations you wanted to have? That it, it helped me that I came out of a tradition of the Haganah, mm -hmm. of the underground soldiers in Israel who helped to create the state of Israel. Mm -hmm. So the combination of my having what is called in Hebrew chutzpah. Chutzpah <laughs> means nerve. In addition to having nerve to talk about something on the air that nobody else talked about, I also had the experience of being a pioneer. Yeah. And it's wonderful. The other day I was at the Museum of Jewish Heritage and uh, again a young male couple came to me one of them introduced his male partner as his husband, mm -hmm. and he said how important I was. Yeah. He was someplace in Indiana, and he heard me say, finish high school, go to a big university, and then go to a big city, 
where there are other people like you. One thing I know and I teach day in and day out that respect is not debatable. Mm. And that wonderful that we have big advances today in terms of all of the different sexual orientations. So I am never embarrassed. Mm -hmm. That's the important lesson to talk, to teach, is not to be embarrassed if you don't know something. Mm -hmm. To say, I don't know, I'll get another expert, or I'll find out the information. And that's what I did in the book, Sex for Dummies, fourth yeah. edition. Yeah. I know that young man is like so many other people who listen to your radio show. And by the mid 80s, the Dr. Ruth show had exploded. You yes. became a cultural icon. You were, had television appearances. Um, did that success surprise you? It, it surprised me, but it, I think it more, it more made me smile <laughs> by saying, look at that little refugee. No parents, no high school diploma. Like, uh, I took lots of courses at the Sorbonne and the New School for Social Research mm -hmm. gave me the credit towards the master's. Then I got a doctorate at Teachers College, Columbia University. Yes. Then I taught, as you know, Princeton many years, Yale many years. I taught at Columbia University until last year. Mm -hmm. So I have, I, I'm smiling because I still have not retired. And I tell everybody else not to retire, but to rewire. Mm, I like that. <laughs> People like can that. have second, third, fourth, fifth acts, right? right. You never stop. <laughs> right. Keep going. Right. And uh, you, your career, like I said, in the 80s and 90s exploded. What was it about that time that made you so su successful? In other mm -hmm. words, how would you describe the America's appetite for conversations yeah. around sex during that time? Okay, first of all, there was a tremendous need for that type of, of uh, yeah. conversation. There was a tremendous need to talk about condoms, a tremendous need to talk about diaphragms, a tremendous need to say what I mentioned to you, mm -hmm. that um, gay people uh, should be active, but they should also be sexually literate by using uh, contraception, mm -hmm. because that's when AIDS became yeah. to creep in. And so I really fulfilled an important, an important message. How much joy did you get from that radio program? Tremendous. I mean, can you imagine with this accent? It's not a put on accent, that's the way I talk. To have the number one listen to radio program on WYNY. Wow. Then I had a very successful television program for many years mm -hmm. on the Lifetime cable television. And now, even at this stage in my life, almost 94, you come here with the whole crew and you are asking me those good questions. Yeah, because <laughs> in my generation, we call it being sex positive, right? All right? But I think you started that trend of being sex positive as long as you, it's two consenting adults, uh, be safe, right? right? As long as you say two consenting adults, everything is okay. Uh -huh. I'm not talking about rape. Mm -mm. I'm not talking about forcing anybody mm -hmm. or, or using, using your status at work uh, um, to force somebody. Mm -hmm. Not talking about that. I'm talking about two consenting adults mm -hmm. and I talk about being responsible and I talk about the importance of being sexually active with the partner that you really enjoy being with. And I don't want to get political, but President Biden is appointing a new Supreme Court justice, and a lot of people are worried about Roe v. Wade being overturned. Yeah, but I don't talk about uh, about politics. But Any, abortion's not politics, right? I, I don't talk about politics because anybody who talks about orgasm from morning till night should not be involved <laughs> in politics. However, I vote. Yeah. Since I'm an American citizen, I always vote. Yeah. And I'm very, very sad if abortion is becoming illegal again, mm. because then only women with money will be able to get an abortion if there is a contraceptive failure. Sometimes people use a diaphragm. Mm -hmm. They use a condom. The condom breaks. Sometimes there's a contraceptive failure. And I'm very sad 
if only women with money, because they can fly to a big city, mm -hmm. they can go to Europe, and very, very sad. Your openness about sex has inspired so many people, but I think especially women, you know, women like me. So why do you think it's so empower important for women to feel empowered about sex? Because many years they thought that sex is only for men. Right. Not so. Sex is very important, and as I said, we still have that legacy of Sigmund Freud, mm -hmm. a kind of implying that sex is only for men. Loud and clear on your program, sex is for both of them. And this is very important to have, if you want to call it sex positive, it's, that's fine with me, um, but very important to have the consent mm. for different positions mm -hmm. between the couple. And if one of the couples doesn't like oral sex, then leave it alone. Or listen to me, and I have some good advice in the book about how women can learn to love it. Mm -hmm. We'll have to get to We'll book. get to it, yeah. <laughs> it seems like we're more comfortable with sex now. There's TV shows about it. There's mm -hmm. podcasts about it. What is your take on where we are as a culture when it comes to sexuality? I think, I think we, as Americans, should be pleased that we had Dr. Helen Singer Kaplan, mm -hmm. and we should be very pleased that we have Dr. Ruth, yes. as they call me, <laughs> and who is still talking from morning to night about sex. Delilah has been reaching listeners across the country for years. And every night from her home studio, she fulfills dedication requests and gives listeners support and encouragement. Now we'll find out what inspires her. I'm Delilah and I am a syndicated radio personality. I also have two podcasts. I am a mom of 20 and a grandmom to 23. Looking back, I realized how incredibly fortunate I was to find my, my passion, to find my calling when I was a kid. Um, I've been fired a lot in this industry. And when my mother was alive, every time I would get fired, she would just wring her hands and say, oh, sis, when are you going to get a real job? When are you going to stop this nonsense? But I had one goal, one mission. My goal was to be the most listened to woman in the history of radio. That was my lighthouse that I was moving towards. So every time I got fired and my mom would wring her hands, I would I would say, mom, this just means that I'm gonna get in a bigger market. I'm gonna get a better opportunity. I'm gonna get to learn more. Even though I didn't have a lot of mentors or women in my industry, I have always had an amazing circle of women around me. They're so important to me that we dedicate every Friday night on my radio show to the vision of female friendships, female empowerment. And the women that I am surrounded with, my friends, my circle of friends, I honestly would not be alive today. Um, I could not have survived especially the loss of two children. Um, I could not have survived without my girlfriends, without my best friends, without my tribe. I was in my 20s working in Seattle and I had developed this show with the help of a woman named Chris Mays who was the only woman program director I had ever worked for. Um, and she, she and I worked together to develop the format of my show at night, but I didn't understand any of the, the business of it. And I had a mentor named Victor Stradicke who wrote an article every week for the Seattle times. And he kind of took me under his wing and asked me some questions and I couldn't answer them. He's like, how much does spot sell for in your show? I'm like, I don't know. I don't know. I had no idea. And he said, if you want to reach your goals and to be successful, you need to learn the business side of this. And because of that, I was able to completely change the dynamic of my show. And then I could walk in and say, okay, 
I've done due diligence. I've gone on the sales calls. I've produced the spots. You're making money. I need a raise. My dad used to say to me, sis, don't ever go in debt. Don't ever go in debt. He said, if you go in debt, you have to keep your job. You have to keep your job because you have to pay the bills. He said, but if you live debt free, you get to make the decisions that are right for your life instead of other people making the decisions. And that stuck in my head, which is a very good thing because I've been fired 12 times in my career. And one of the most painful was after I learned the value of my show, after I learned how much money it could potentially earn. And I was making like barely minimum wage. So I went into the general manager and said, you know, I did this, I did that. I brought the ratings up. I, I went on sales calls. We've got some huge clients and I want a big raise, a big fat raise. And he said, no, he said, you're going to get a 5% raise like everybody else. And I said, okay, I'm not signing this contract. And three weeks later, I packed my bags and moved 5,000 miles away uh, to start a new life on the East Coast. And I, I was, I was sad. I was hurt. I, I went in the bathroom and cried for an hour. A friend came and got me and took me home. But I, I knew that my dad's lesson of not going in debt paid off. I took an amazing offer, making far more money than I was asking for. And I moved to Boston, Massachusetts and changed my life. My impact, especially for young women, I have eight daughters and 12 with my stepdaughters. So um, my impact is I want them and I want every woman that ever encounters me on a podcast, uh, on my radio show to know that you are amazing, that you are a miracle, that you are capable. And you don't change the world, I don't believe, by being a, a, a big superstar or a political leader so much. You change the world one heart at a time by actively caring about the people that you are surrounded with. So I want all women, not just here, but around the world. And I want them to know that you are enough that you are enough and you're a miracle and whatever it is you purpose in your heart is your path do it and do it with gusto and do it with pride and do it with passion and do it with integrity be honest use integrity and as my dad said don't go in debt because that way you got the power to say kiss my grits i'm not i'm not settling i'm not doing that and hold your head up and walk on to the next opportunity. There is still this notion in our industry that women can't be blank. We can't be successful on the air. We can't be morning host. We can't be, you know, whatever, which is just absurd. So I recently bought the little station that I started on in Reedsport, my hometown. And I'm, I'm thinking and I'm looking and I'm, I'm trying to find, you know, all the right pieces to bring together. And the way it worked out is my general manager is a beautiful, strong woman that moved up from California. My uh, promotions director is a young, fun, funny, sweet, young lady in her early 20s who moved here from Arizona. And my morning show is hosted by a young woman named Cece that was one of my producers in the past. And I'm like, wow, without even knowing it, I built my dream team. <laughs> I said I have a, a charity, Point Hope, and we work in West Africa. We've done some work in Haiti. And there, the abuse of young women is 
so beyond what I could even wrap my head around when I started. And we need to think outside of our neighborhood and outside of our experience and look at ways that we can help and empower kids that we work with that don't even have opportunities to go to grade school or junior high or high school. The more we can encourage education for young women, health care for young women, man, we can, we can make the world a better place for everybody. And coming up, we have a James Beard Award winner who has lit the kitchen on fire since she became the first female winner on Top Chef. Welcome back to Inspo to Impact. Our next guest is a James Beard award-winning chef and founder of the popular restaurant, Girl and the Goat. Hi, I'm Girl and the Goat owner, Chef Stephanie Izard, here to talk about who inspired me and who I hope to inspire. It's hard to pinpoint what my first actual moment that I loved food. I sometimes look back at my childhood and remember these different things that um, kind of were a cue. My mom was an amazing cook and she um, would cook things from all over the world. So we were always in the kitchen making mandarin pancakes from Mushu or making tempura together. Um, just doing so many things in the kitchen together. I think I just grew up with a love of food, being out in the garden, picking things. And just, it was part of our family. We ate together as a family all the time, sometimes in front of the TV if the Olympics were on or something really awesome on TV. Um, but for the most part, it was just a very central piece of our family. So I think we all just love food all the time. Thinking back, the first time that I ever cooked something on my own, I was uh, eight years old. We had actually just gone on a family trip to Epcot, where you get to eat around the world. And it's still to this day, it's the only time I've eaten in Paris, which is so sad as a chef that I haven't been to actual Paris. I promised to get there this year if possible. But we had crepes, and they were crepes with ham and cheese and mushrooms. And when we got back home, I used my mom's cookbook to figure out how to make crepes. And the rest of it, I just kind of made up. And my mom used to tell the story that they tasted exactly like the crepes we had in, in the fake Paris. Um, and I can still kind of remember remember what it tastes like and I think that's how chefs think because like we can taste in our minds a little bit and I still have that memory but that was the first time I ever kind of got in the kitchen by myself and made a dish all the way through. I think looking at the chef world that I'm in right now, you know, I look back to when I was younger and my biggest inspiration was my mom. You know, that was how I got into this industry so not necessarily by a female chef that I was looking at. Um, I didn't actually work for any female chefs coming up and I think that it's amazing that there are more female chefs popping up now. Some of my best chef friends are um, are females and they have multiple restaurants and they're also juggling doing some TV stuff and doing other fun things. So I think there's a lot of 
women in the industry to look up to now and it's ever growing. And so some of the women that reach out to me sometimes, whether it's on Instagram or they come work in my restaurants and I want to be able to inspire them to jump in on it too, just go for it and not be afraid of um, anything, not be afraid of, don't think of yourself as I'm going to be the best female chef, just say, I'm gonna be the best chef that I can be. It doesn't matter if you're a male or a female. Um, I actually did the Kelly Clarkson show the other day and they had her reading the prompter on what she was gonna say to introduce me. And the prompter said, introducing one of the best female chefs in the industry. And she was like, stop, stop, let's just redo this. She's like, can I just say that she's one of the most badass chefs in the industry and just leave the female part out of it? Which um, I looked at her, we just kind of had that moment. She's really awesome. And I um, usually respect what she's done in her industry. So I think it was sort of one of those mutual respect things of just be awesome for just being, working hard and doing the best that you can be. Um, and don't let your sex or any other thing about you or your background hold you back. Being a chef is definitely um, a challenging field to be in. And I think I, I'm actually in the kitchen today. This is why I'm wearing this apron. So I'm in the kitchen working on setting up a station um, because I still do that at our newer restaurants. And it is hard. It's hard, especially as you get older and you've been doing this for 25 years and you've been setting up stations for so many years to keep motivated. But in my mind, while I'm setting up the station, I'm thinking about new dishes and we have to launch brunch in a couple of weeks. So what are we going to put on the brunch menu? So I keep my mind going on some creative food thinking while I'm kind of chopping onions and chopping tomatoes and things like that. As far as being a female in the industry, it's interesting. I always try to look back at when I first started and what sort of hurdles did I have? And some of them are things I put on myself and some of them are things maybe from the environment of people around me. So um, some of it's just physical, simple things. Like I used to lift the giant stock pot by myself because I just wanted to prove that I could do it, that I didn't need one of the guys to come help me. And now I have a bad back and I will forever thanks to that. So silly things where it's like, it's okay to be, I'm short and I am strong, but I cannot live. Nobody should lift that by themselves. Um, so really realizing that it's okay to ask for help, whether you're male or female. Um, then there were certain kitchens that I worked in where I was one of the only women in the kitchen. And I tried to find ways to kind of jump into it. Like uh, when everybody was playing um, fantasy football, I was like, all right, well, all these 20 dudes are going to talk about fantasy football for this entire season. And I do love football. I went to Michigan, go blue. Um, but I'd never played before. And I was like, well, I'm going to play so that I can be part of the conversation. Otherwise, I'm going to be super bummed out for the next two months when this is all they talk about. So little things where I tried to not just be one of the guys, but just kind of be part of the conversation, I guess, or just be in the mix. Um, and then I realized that, you know, just kind of do the best that you can and be the best you can in the kitchen. And whether you're male or female, just do the best job you can. And that's what's going to get you there. I was really fortunate not to work for any chefs that ever held me back due to being a female. I know that there's a lot of women that have had those challenges, but I was very fortunate not to. Um, I don't know. I sometimes look at other things in the industry. I am 45 years old and I have a five-year-old. Might seem like I'm a little behind on this. A lot of my, a lot of the other mom friends I have are like 30 years old. Um, so, but what I did was I waited until I was a little further along in my career before I was ready for that because I was doing so much with my job. So it is hard to juggle. It's hard to, you know, build a family or make babies and also run restaurants at the same time. So I think that's also like another hurdle. Um, yeah, I, it's a, interesting. I think that there will continue to be more and more women in the industry and more and more women um, becoming chefs and running their restaurants. And I hope that by doing that, I can inspire more women to do the same. I always like to look at the way I approach my career as inspiring in the sense that I never really think about anything too much. And I just take a lot of risks and chances. And it's maybe not the best idea all the time for everyone, but um, that's what's gotten to me to where I am today is by not being scared to just kind of do things. Um, I, of course, I'm always nervous. Everybody is about what other people think and like, are, especially now with social media, everybody's you know judging every step that you take, but try not to look at that too much and just do your thing and do what makes you happy. I've taken a lot of risks and sort of not listen to other people's suggestions that I shouldn't do things, say for with my sauce and spice line, I think a lot of people look at it and think I'm crazy um, of all the things that I'm doing in that space outside of the restaurants and say, you shouldn't do that. You might lose some money or you shouldn't do that. Like that's too risky. Um, and my thought is, well, I mean, I just want to, so I'm just gonna try it. <laughs> Let's see what happens.
Soy Sofía Ira y soy modelo de Victoria's Secret Love Club. Que cuando yo era pequeña, dije que quiero ser modelo, que quiero ser empresaria y una buena trabajadora del mundo entero sin límite. Mi mamá me inspira porque es la mejor madre del mundo entero y una mamá que yo amo y que la quiero mucho cuando yo estaba pequeña y de grande. Mi mamá me ayudó a aprender muchas cosas y ponerme el límite y ya lo tengo. Porque por dentro y por fuera no hay límites. Y soy una mujer muy educada y disciplinada también. Pues llamaron a Alessandra Correa por teléfono o le envió un, un email y después de ahí me llamaron, me conectaron, me fui a un avión, cogí la maleta, me fui, me fui al aeropuerto, me monté en un carro, llegué y reparamos el arco de la cámara de, de brasier y todo, bien cómodo, perfecto de Victoria's Secret. Conocí a todas las modelos de Victoria's Secret. Me fue muy bien, me quedó súper cool, brutal. Pero yo le dijera que por dentro y por fuera no hay límites y toda la comunidad que son síndrome Down o sin, síndrome Down normal, regular, les dijera que, que pueden trabajar duro, mantenerse y les dijera que por dentro y por fuera no hay límite y que tú puedes lograr un montón que te propongas y que pueden soñar en grande. Mi próximo sueño es Bailar en un escenario y a bailar con todas las artistas. Y conocer a Shakira, a Beyoncé y a Larry Gaga y Jennifer López. Porque todas ellas me inspiran, porque todo el mundo logra su meta igualito a mí. Y que pueden lograr sus sueños, su meta y no limites. I know, leave me. Up next, we sat down with bobsledding gold and silver medalists from the Beijing Winter Olympics to talk about what inspires them and what it takes to achieve the highest honor in sports.
My name is Kaylee Humphreys. My name is Alana Myers-Taylor. I am a four-time Olympic medalist, three-time Olympic champion in the sport of women's bobsled. I'm a five-time Olympic medalist in the sport of bobsled for Team USA. My inspiration growing up was my mother. She really showed me what it's like to be a strong woman. She was raising three young kids while my dad was playing professional football and he was also stationed in the Gulf War. So doing that all on her own, um, she really showed me what it means to be a strong woman and how to put the needs of other people ahead of you and also how to take care of yourself. There really has been multiple people. My mom being one that has really made an impact and was an inspiration to me. So women in general that have been badass that have gone out and battled have always been top of my list. What got me into bobsled and what really was my driving force from when I was a kid was going to the Olympic Games. And that is what I wanted. That is what I wanted to chase. Not only the medal itself, but the feelings and the pride. And so for me growing up, starting in ski racing, that was what I, I thought, I'm gonna go to the Olympics and do. This is what I absolutely love. Within the sport of bobsled, my biggest inspiration has been Vanetta Flowers. Uh, in 2002, she won the first gold medal for the Winter Olympics for an African-American. And just seeing her, knowing that she was somebody who looked like me, and she's from right down the street in Birmingham, Alabama. Um, I'm in Georgia, so seeing that, uh, it really, made it real for me and really showed me that I could be successful in the sport of bobsled. I've had multiple inspirations throughout my career. Growing up, Marnie McBean has been very influential. She was a Canadian rower. Her words of encouragement and understanding that being able to chat to another female who had been an, an Olympic champion before and her mindset was so influential to me. I was heading into an Olympic games trying to defend an Olympic gold medal. These two right here and no one in women's bobsled had ever defended an Olympic gold medal before. To date, I'm still the only female to defend an Olympic gold medal. But going into 2014, I remember being fearful, having this huge target on my back and being able to look up to and connect with another female who had defended an Olympic gold medal throughout her career, who knew what it was like to partner with another teammate um, and you know how to balance you know, female thought process and then understand how to deal with pressure and be successful at it. There weren't many women I could really look up to in that sense. You know, beyond bobsledding and beyond winter sports in general, we're always fighting for gender equity. And I think sport is a microcosm of society. I think it's important for athletes, especially women, to speak out against abuse and harassment. Um, because in our sport, it's a very male dominated sport. And unfortunately, not only myself, but other athletes have found themselves in scenarios where your accomplishments are diminished. You're labeled as hard to deal with or challenging or, you know, not popular. Hopefully by showing, particularly in my case, that you can be a mother, that you can be a female and still succeed at the highest level. Hopefully that bleeds into other areas. You know, I think, paid maternal leave is always something that's on the table, always something that's being discussed. And hopefully people start to realize how important it is not only to compensate mothers when they're doing hard work outside of the office, but also create an atmosphere where they can continue to leave their, live their dreams and continue to pursue their passions despite them being a mother or in conjunction of them being a mother. I think it was extremely important for Alana and myself to be advocating for greater opportunity for females within sport. And now I think the big push is, again, a, the, a women's four-man event um, to create true equality within our sport. But in order for us to get there, it definitely took Alana and I breaking down a lot of stereotypes, breaking down um, a lot of misconceptions about women in sport and female drivers. I'm currently coaching and our help coach a couple of the brakemen that are learning how to go into driving now. So Keisha Love, her and I have been in contact quite a bit. She was my brakeman at the games and I know she's learning how to drive this week in Lake Placid. I've worked with Classroom Champions, an organization that directly mentors students in the classroom um, for many years now. And what we do is record videos every month about goal setting, um, 
healthy living, all these different types of attributes. So I've been blessed to mentor many students throughout the years. I've also been very uh, vocal about helping a lot of our next generation, male or female. For me to be able to serve as an inspiration, hopefully a, a guidance to other people, and not just as a successful female, but as somebody that has battled through a lot of different ups and downs within my sporting career and within my life. Just because of my accomplishments in sports and, and my experience in that, inside the sport of bobsled, um, I try to help out as many people as I can. I serve on the International Bobsled and Skeleton Federation's um, Athlete Advisory Committee, I'm the Women's Bobsled Rep. So I try to help out as much as I can there. I just try to be the best representative of myself as possible. And if I'm able to help people along the way, I'm gonna do whatever it takes to continue to grow our sport. The biggest piece of advice I would probably give is that every day, you just gotta put one foot in front of the other. Um, every day is not gonna be perfect. You're not gonna get everything done every single day, but as long as you're making forward progress, you're putting one foot in front of the other, you're going to be successful. And sometimes that means reaching out for help. I feel like most days that means reaching out for help um, and having those people around you who are willing to help just give you aid in any possible way and even just pick you up and tell you, hey mom, you're doing a great job, um, goes a long way. I think it's vital for women to hold each other up because nobody else is going to do it. And I think it's important as a female to feel empowered and courageous. And when we look at other women and we see them succeed, it gives us internal confidence to know that if they can do it, we can do it too at the same time. And whether that be an Olympic champion or a stay-at-home mom or a professor or a doctor, there are no limits. I think the biggest thing I would tell any mother trying to figure it all out is First, that we can have it all. Um, maybe not all at the same time, but we can have it all. I really hope that my story and my journey can help empower other athletes and other female athletes to believe in themselves, to dream big, um, to not listen to what other people have to say, and to have confidence. Having now become the most successful Black Winter Olympian ever uh, is kind of overwhelming. I'm um, kind of surreal, but I also hope it leaves a legacy uh, that many athletes want to follow. Um, you know, I've been able to win five Olympic medals and, and hopefully there's a little girl out there that's going to go on to win six and, and six gold medals. You know, I think seeing is believing and hopefully people are able to see themselves in me and also not limit themselves. And for me, other women throughout my career have enabled me to believe and succeed in that way. And I really hope that my journey and story and through my actions and me showing up and, and doing the best that I can do, that that really motivates them to do that for themselves.
So you're not retiring anytime soon. There is no such thing for me as to retire. And I tell other people not to retire, but to rewire. All right. If you don't want to do what you did until now, do something else. I hear you because you're still writing books. I still write books. Can I show you Please. one? Please, yeah. All right. Now, first of all, this I got yesterday <gasps> reissued. Fresh off the presses. This, and it's the art of arousal. Dr. Ruth K. Westheimer. Yes. And there are many people I give credit in the back mm -hmm. who helped me. I love this new edition. But the beauty of this is it shows sexuality throughout history, right? Exactly. So sexuality is a part of human life. Exactly. And look at that nice format. Mm -hmm. the, the, the Abbeville publisher yeah. did a beautiful job. It is a beautiful book. What's this Listen, book? This one, Heavenly Sex, the reason I was able to talk so openly about orgasm, erection, lubrication, everything, in the Jewish tradition, sex has never been a sin. Mm. Sex has always been an obligation of a husband with a wife. I did a book, and as we speak, it just came out as a classic NYU press. Wow. Will never be out of print. And guess what? That book is just coming out now as we speak, in a few weeks, in German, by the, muse by the Jewish Museum in Vienna. And I'm talking now to the Jewish Museum in Berlin yeah. so that they will also take it. Dr. Ruth, you're that so busy. Before we go, I mean, I, I would love to talk to you about me. Do you have any advice for me as a 36-year-old woman Ooh, about Wait, sex? wait, wait. Wait? Never would I do that on television. Oh, okay. Now tell me differently. I'll tell you how. Okay. You know a friend of a friend oh, who okay. is 36. Mm -hmm. Now tell me the yes. story. So I have this friend, yes. and she's 36, yes. and she's single and dating in New York. Any advice for her? Yes. Number one, don't be so choosy. Okay. You, ha you just came here with a crew of four guys. <laughs> I don't know which one is married. Don't touch them. I don't, <laughs> but let, seriously speaking, not sexually speaking, seriously speaking, let everybody know that you are looking for a significant other. Don't say marriage. Mm. Say for a significant other. Dr. Ruth, I just want to thank you, one, for inviting me into your home. Thank you. And thank you for just sitting here and chatting with me. It's been a highlight for me. And you had wonderful, good questions. I tell you something else, as a professor, you were very well prepared. Oh. I would give you an A. I want to thank all of you for watching Yahoo's Inspo to Impact. I'm Brittany Jones Cooper, and I hope the women you met today inspire you to make a change, help others, or finally take that next step you've been dreaming of, because everyone can make an impact.